Hey guys, welcome to BP, the Bible Perspective. What God Thinks About Interracial Marriage, Part 2. Why is this still a problem today? But before we get into it, please like and share this video and subscribe to BP, the Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought or comment, add it to the comments section below. All comments are welcome. This is Part 2 of me breaking down why or what God thinks about interracial marriage and coming from the perspective how many people have a problem with interracial marriage. They think the races should be separated. And even in the Christian world, the evangelical Christian world, there are those that say God wants the races separate. A couple of weeks ago, I did a video about on this pastor, a black pastor who says, God says interracial marriage is a sin. You can check that video out. He lied, okay, but, <laughs> um, and I dealt with, I, I, again, I unpacked that video. I unpacked his statement. He ran it on, basically, is what he did. He just did one big, long rant, but I digress. The reason why he thinks that way is because from the inception of this nation, we have been taught, we have been conditioned to think that race should be separate, the races should be separate. When we go back to the very founding fathers, they, and I, and reason why I'm gonna have to focus on this is because remember, they condition America. They were, they, crafted the framework of America. You have to remember that, <clears throat> I'm gonna read this so that I can get it correct. It says, remember, this is one of the statements, one of the key statements in the Declaration of Independence of 1776. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, of course, when they pin these words, most of the, uh, most of the founding fathers own slaves, right? Here's the list, kind of a chart of the founding fathers. And as you can see in one column, it said slaveholders. And then the other column says non-slaveholders. So about a quarter, a little over a quarter of the founding fathers didn't own slave. Three quarters of them own slave yet pin the words that all men are created equal. So obviously they didn't believe that because at the time of the writing, they own slave. So now we have to understand, we should understand, how is that possible? Well, because of the conditioning of the mind. And I, in part one, you can go back and I unpack it a little more uh, in depth. And that you start with how certain men from, uh, from Europe, Caucasians, begin to target one specific group of people. Now here is where we define the technical definition of racism, what racism is. Uh, the connotation of racism today is people will say, you're a racist. I have been called a racist. Not that people really believe that, it's just more of an insult. But people do, uh, people do use the word racist or racism uh, from the perspective of just long, in, without understanding why, if you call me a racist, you got to have receipts for that. Now, we certainly can say America was racist. Why? Because they targeted a, a specific group of people and said they were superior to that group of people. They said the other group of people were inferior, and then they used their superiority, their authority to oppress that specific people 
okay, that one group of people. So in the case of the Atlantic slave trade, white targeted blacks, Caucasians targeted Africans, European targeted Africans for slavery. So that's the definition. That word racism did not come into use until the Atlantic slave trade. And that's different than other forms of slavery, which those who try to uh, sanitize America's evil, they try to say, well, there was slavery all over the world, which shows themselves the evil that resides in them, when you have to defend evil like that. But I dealt with it because slavery has been a part of the fallen man. Pretty much, if you go back in history, if you were conquered, you were you were going to be a slave. You're going to need to be killed or slave or, or, or enslaved. Okay, so that that's the world. But what made the Atlantic slave trade different is that during the 14th century, they begin to target and say that black people, okay, black people were enslaved. I mean, were were inferior. Now, there were two concepts that they used with that. The chief was the, what's called the curse of Ham, Noah's son. I'll get to that later. The curse of Ham. Now, of course, they perverted the scripture, but they, that's what they used. They begin to say that, okay, the African or dark-skinned people were inferior to the Caucasian people. And so with colonization, the European colonization, that's how racism spread throughout the entire world. So when you came to the Atlantic slave trade, they targeted one group of people and they bought and sold slaves. Why? Because they did not consider the uh, Africans as humans. So then when you when, the, when the, the import of those slaves to the Americas, beginning in 1619, you then had 157 years of natural born Africans on this soil. They were slaves. So by the time we get to 1776, when we had the pinning of the Declaration of Independence, well, who were Americans at that time? <clears throat> who were the citizens that they referred to? Well, it was naturally born citizens, European, Caucasians on this land. You, you will note that the immigration debate and uh, uh, arguments that we have today existed back in the 17th and 18th century. In fact, European immigrants were discriminated against. Um, <clears throat> okay, but... And the reason why they were discriminated against is because the, the natural born citizens said that they were superior, said that they were better. And they didn't feel that the immigrants coming, if you're not, if you wasn't naturally born, they did not feel that you were worthy of American citizenship. But the hypocrisy, of course, is in 1776, when America declared its freedom and broke away from Britain, remember, natural born citizens did that. And at the time they were engrafted as citizens with full rights of the United States, all except the naturally born African slaves. Forget the imported slave. Remember you had um, some over 10 generations from 1619 to 1776 of slaves that were born on this land. They were born from 1776 to 1865, naturally born slaves. So how did America, how did America then justify morally their position? And as I said before, there are three ways that they had to convince and condition the minds of white America. And keep in mind, 
These were the men, the founding fathers, that crafted the way we think. Imagine, <clears throat> imagine you go over to your neighbor's house, and I'm just going to say not, not your own, we get to that in a moment, but imagine you go to your neighbor's house, your uncle's house, and you go to his plantation, you see his slaves. Then you look at them and go, well, who are those dark-skinned people? You were taught, you were conditioned to think that those slaves work in the field. Those slaves, and sometimes, in some cases, in chains. Those slaves being whipped. Those slaves serving the masters were inferior. That's what you were conditioned to think. And thus, you justified in your mind, okay, well, it's okay to have those people. Even though in 1776, the, the phrase, all men are created equal, didn't apply to the Africans, not the dark-skinned men. So when we come to 1865, of course, there was a hard fought war to end slavery. America always wrestled in their conscience with the evils of this end of racism. Many good rights said it was wrong. Uh, I'll give you another case too. Even the racists, the slaveholders, Many of them knew that slavery was wrong. Thomas Jefferson knew it was wrong. George Washington knew it was wrong, despite that he owned slaves. George Washington freed his slaves, uh, I think, at, the, at his death. Thomas Jefferson, mm, no. But the other interesting thing here is that what, what is amazing to me was that there was no moral outcry against these men. Even to this day, there is no moral outcry to these men that if you truly believe that they were inferior, that they were not as human as you are, then where was the moral outcry for the perversion of sleeping with these uh, slaves that you claim are inferior to you? That's the hypocrisy. And all through Jim Crow, remember, you still had the, uh, the uh, uh, producing of biracial children, okay? And they were produced by these men who said, who owned slaves, and who said that they were inferior. Where was the moral outcry? So that's why America then uh, persisted in their justification of slavery and the separation from Europeans and Blacks, unless the slave master wanted to sleep with one of their slaves. Okay, so now let's bring in the Christians. Let's bring in the Christian because remember, even today, many evangelicals will say this is a Christian nation. So how do Christians justify? How do the Christians say this is okay, that interracial marriage is wrong? Then, and if you notice, they never talk about the biracial children. Not, not really, because in order to talk about the biracial children, you would have to talk about who produced the biracial children. But after 1865, when the, the war was fought, everybody wasn't happy about that. Everybody wasn't even sighing a release of saying, we have rid ourselves of the sin, the great sin of slavery. When America could, when America could no longer profit from their slaves, when they could no longer abuse, I'm talking about through the, the sexual sins. So the law outlawed, <coughs> outlawed slavery, they discarded the people. And thus we enter the era of Jim Crow. We, we go into the segregation. Now remember, America then legally, constitutionally, has been a 
racist nation for most of its history, for most of its history. And obviously, as we move forward in time, that, that, that time is going to eventually overlap. Right now, we're sitting around 80%. We're 80%. So when you hear some of the fools of conservative news media who try to say, well, we're, you know, how could you say that America is a racist nation and their arguments against CRT, they never talk about the historic racism that existed up into 1965, the historic legal constitutional racism. So now America then said, okay, so America is inferior in every way. And one of the ways that, well, several ways in which racism was embedded in the minds of the people. One, through laws. It was illegal uh, for blacks to be free. And various laws produced that. It was illegal. It was a, it, it, and then you had the pseudoscience that said, uh, blacks were inferior to whites in every way. Now, of course, over the years, <clears throat> that has been debunked on every single level. Every single level. Even today, you have things called the bell curve, which basically says blacks are inferior, genetically, genetically inferior to white. Genetically. In other words, see, that, that was a something from the racist past that when you when you the, 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 the scores test scores right prove and demonstrate that uh blacks are inferior uh so pseudoscience right that in every way blacks you know medically emotionally um uh, genetically physically they is that they are inferior to white. Now, what I want to get to today is talk about the Christian. See, the Christian who were um, complicit, <coughs> excuse me, in slavery. <coughs> excuse me, the Christians who um, you could not racism, slavery, Jim Crow could not have existed without the complicity of the evangelical Christian church. In fact, every denomination wrestled with slavery and racism. Not only did they wrestle with it, they outlived it. Remember, institutional racism was outlawed uh, by the 64 and 65 Civil Rights Bill. Many Christian denominations held on, and we're going to get to a couple of them, their racism well into the 90s. That they Most of them didn't really formally repent of their racism. So some 30 years after uh, America said, we're going to outlaw it, there were many Christian denominations that said, no, 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 racism is a part. Now, again, it ties into interracial marriage because when you say that blacks and whites should not marry, why? We, we get to all of the scriptures in a moment, all the reasoning, but <clears throat> what is sad <clears throat> is remember this verse we said here, he said, but if I should delay, if I should be delayed, this is first Timothy chapter three, verse fifteen, but if I should but if I should be delayed, I have written so that you may know how people ought to act in God's household, <clears throat> which is the church of the living God, and then here's the thing, the pillar and the foundation of truth. And the reason why I wanted to bring that up is because this is where we failed the most. We have and when it comes to race, we have been worse than the world. We have been nothing more than the world. Okay, nothing more than the world. When we entered the era of Jim Crow, 
And again, remember, slavery dealt the, the death blow. I mean, the, 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 the Civil War dealt the um, uh, death blow to slavery, so the institution of slavery. And again, America always well, uh, um, uh, wrestled with that, and I believe that they outlaw the import and export of slaves in, I believe, 1865. In other words, you couldn't buy them from them, you couldn't bring them in, but they, okay, even though they said that that was wrong, but you could keep your slaves. And so the institution persisted for another, what, 30-something years, 35 years, into the war. <clears throat> and then when you couldn't, so then when the war, again, said, okay, slavery was over, Okay, so now let's discard this race of people. So that's the continuation of the racism. And remember, the racism did not exist until the Atlantic slave trade because it targeted one group of people. And America, who claimed to be the greatest nation, who claimed to be Christian, right? They claimed to be the Christian nation, targeted one group of people and said, these people are not equal. These people are not created equal by God. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when we entered the, the era of Jim Crow, the segregation, they said, okay, blacks, you over there. In fact, in Montgomery, which started one of the civil rights movement, was kind of the spark of the civil rights movement, was the law which says blacks had to sit in uh, separate sections. The, the, the segregation uh, counters. Seg you can eat in the restaurants, cafe restaurants, okay? Um, at best, there was colored sections. Because in their minds, remember they're pep uh, uh, perpetrating the racism, which means what? White are superior, blacks are inferior. And so they're so inferior, we can't mix with them unless we creep with them. But again, I keep throwing that in there because white men had no problem sleeping with black women, even in Jim Crow. But as far as equality, as far as laws and stuff, it was always separate. Blacks had to sit in the back of the bus in, in Montgomery. There was a section. They had to pay their fare. They would go in the front door, pay their fare, get off the bus and walk to the back and get on and sit in the colored section, which is an extreme back. Sometimes evil bus drivers would drive off after they paid their fare. And of course, there was nothing you could do about it because yeah, that was the time. And, it, and and even if, if, if you had a situation where the white, uh, the bus was full and a white person had nowhere to sit, a black person had to give up their, their seat, even though they paid, even though they were in the colored section. And that's where Rosa Parks come in at, because Rosa Parks said, I'm not giving up my seat this day. She was tired. I'm not giving it up. And she was arrested. And that sparked the civil rights movement starting with the Montgomery bus boycott. And that was the first victory to ending segregation. But that wouldn't happen for another few years until the 64, 65 uh, voting right. During this time, <clears throat> during this time, you had different Christian denomination. Now remember, Christian denominations, certain Christian denominations outlived even segregation by some 30 years. There's a couple examples. You have Jerry Farwell, and then you have um, Bob Jones on the right. Now Jerry Farwell started his Thomas Rowe Baptist Church, Liberty Temple University. He was the leader of the moral majority of the 60s. 
but a staunch racist. In fact, he once said that when they were fighting for the integration of the public schools, he said, you are fighting against the will of God. His counterpart, Bob Jones, started his school early as well. <clears throat> With the strict, now, Jerry Farwell was a segregationist, but Bob Jones, not only was he a segregationist, but he fought to keep blacks out. He fought. If you were black, you were not allowed in his school, even if you were a believer. Even if you believed in the same Jesus as he did. No, 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 no. In fact, in one speech, he even said, you know, God is for the separation of the races. Oh, yeah, God wants us. Now, he even made this bold statement. He said, well, in heaven, we might be unified. We might be in unity. But here, God wants us separate. Now, remember, these men conditioned, right? They, were, they, they frame um, evangelicals. Of course, the man in the center is John MacArthur. Now, John MacArthur of late in 20, in, in, the, in, in the 20th, uh, the 2000, 2020, 2021, 2022, has been a fierce opponent of CRT, social justice, even saying that social justice is the most dangerous controversy in the last 100 years. Uh, understand the seeds of racism. Now, he also has said that slavery was really good. I mean, look, if you have a good master, he said, there was nothing wrong with slavery. Nothing wrong with it, he says. Of course, if you had a good master, all was well. Why do we have such a problem with slavery? So that's, that's this is, again, he's a Calvinist. Um, he is a evangelical leader shaping the minds of people, conditioning the minds of people. That even in 2024, he still spews his racism, okay? Still spews racism. He went to Bob Jones University. So when he says that social justice, now remember, social justice you could say the sparks of social justice in terms of winning the victories with hmm, the Montgomery Boy bus stop. So you mean to tell me that uh, that that social justice was worse than the racism of Bob Jones University? Now, Bob Jones University, okay, Bob Jones University fought hard to keep blacks out. So then they end up getting into a war with the government. The government says, ah, you are tax, tax exempt. So now you're in violation. They still said, still, no blacks. No blacks. We don't care what you say, no blacks. Finally, the government rescinded, revoked their tax exempt status. Even then, in the hardness of their racism, they said, okay, fine. But greed won out. I mean, see, that tax exempt is good. So after a while, they started like feeling the effects of not having that tax exempt. So in 1971, they said, okay, give us our tax uh, exempt back. Government says, well, you got to let the blacks in. I says, okay, we'll let the blacks in. Deal? Government said, fine. So now they can enjoy their tax pledge. Not from a godly perspective. Remember, the church is the pillar in the um, foundation of truth, or they should be. But Bob Jones said, okay, we're going to let the blacks in, but you know what? No interracial dating or marriage. So you can have a white on white couple, black on black couple, but no black on white couples, no interracial. You'll be expelled. The government didn't make any beef over that, right? So that went on until the 2000s. Now think about that, 1971 to 2000. Bob Jones was a star, says no dating. Why? Because Bob Jones said 
it is against God's will. It is against God's nature. It's against God's law. No interracial dating, no interracial marriage. In 2000, when a young George Bush <clears throat> was running for president, he stopped by Bob Jones University, and then he was heavily criticized. Bob Jones decided, well, you know what? We want to be politically active. So you know what? This is going to be a stumbling block to us. So we'll lift the ban. So we're going to kind of close our eyes and say, if you want to enter, uh, you know, if you want to violate God's uh, law by interming intermingling, fine, go ahead. We're going to keep our stack <laughs> tax exempt status. And we're going to, you know, we want to keep inviting certain people into our plat on our platforms. And it wouldn't be until 2007 that the grandson of Bob Jones, I think it's great grandson at this point, the great grandson of Bob Jones finally said, you know what, we were wrong. Now get this, 2007. Every Christian denomination split over the issue of race, racism. The Southern Baptists, the largest Protestant denomination in, the, in, in America, started in 1845 pro-slavery. And remember, they did not, they didn't, they were segregationists. They didn't let blacks in. They still wrestle with that. There's still people in their church, in their denomination that said, you know what? <laughs> we don't like the blacks. But they formally, now get this, they formally said, we were wrong about slavery. We repented about slavery in the mid 90s, 1990s. So why why do people, why do they hold on to this? Uh, why do they hold on to this? Um, hmm. Why do they hold on to this? Okay, um, uh, why do they hold on to this racism view okay um now i'm going to come back to these guys here in a moment to see why because some of you all might may wonder how in the world can i have these guys but i'll come back to them because i want to show you again how racism was pervasive in 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 some of the world leading uh ministries all right but let me I'm gonna show I'm gonna share two scriptures. Two scriptures. Um okay. Oh two scriptures. Oh my screen didn't share. Hold on guys, my screen didn't share. Here we go. All right. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to go to Genesis. Uh, first of all, I'm going to go to Genesis. No, that's not what I wanted to do with the screen here because I'm already here, guys. But I'm going to go. I'm setting up another verse of scripture where I'm going to go in a moment. Uh, so Acts 17, but all right. Um, So this is kind of the genesis of where the race, where Christians use their justification for racism and interracial marriage, okay? Interracial marriage. So the first one is, so I'm going to start reading because I want to kind of We'll unpack it just a little bit, but this is Genesis chapter 9. This is right after the flood. And now, as you know, Noah, Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives are now the only ones alive on the earth. It says, uh, verse 1 says, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Right? So just, he says, The fear and terror of you would be in every living creature on the earth. 
every bird of the sky, every creature that crawls on the ground, and all the fish of the sea. They are placed under your authority. Every living creature will be every living creature will be food for you. As I gave the green plants, I've given you everything. However, you must not eat the meat with its lifeblood in it. I require the life of every animal for every man, okay, and every man for your life and your blood. And I require a life of each uh, man, brother, uh, for his life. Now, I want to skip down to verse number 18. So, notice the command of God, right? So, you got Noah's three sons and his wife. So, the question, let's ask the question here. What were the race of Noah's son and his wife. What were the race? Well, really the Bible doesn't tell us. Right? We we don't know. There's no there's you got three sons. So watch this. At this point, there is no distinction. So from Adam to Noah, right, there's no at least distinction to say these people look like this with this certain DNA versus these people look like that with this certain DNA. So you got Noah, his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, this is what happens now. It says Noah's sons who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. And that's going to be important to this right here. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were Noah's sons. And from them, the whole earth was populated. Now, Noah was a man of the soil. He was the first to plant a vineyard. He drank some of the wine, became drunk, and uncovered himself inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, keep that in mind. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his naked, saw his father naked and told his brothers outside. Now, one of the problems here is how you define the term nakedness. One, it could be you see somebody actually naked, which seems to be what's going on here. But the other euphemism in Genesis is that nakedness was a euphemism for sex, having sex, having promiscuous sex, okay? So the controversy is, what did Ham, did Ham have sex with his father or do something inappropriate with his father? Or did he just see his father's nakedness, okay? So... Verse 22, he says, Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father naked and told his brothers outside. Then Shem, Shem, and Jeff and Jepha took a cloak and placed it over both their shoulders. And walking backwards, they covered their father's nakedness, and their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father nakedness. It seemed to me that the only thing that was going on here was the fact that they saw it, and they did not want to look upon their father's nakedness. There is also, the, now look at the next verse, verse 24. He says, now when Noah woke from his drinking and learned what his youngest son had done to him, he said, stop. So what, what did he do, do to him? Well, at the very least, he just looked at him naked. He looked at him and go, oh, look at him naked. Now at the very worst, he could have done more than just look. Okay. So whatever it was, here's how Noah responded. Verse 25, he said, Canaan will be cursed. He will be the lowest of slaves to his brothers. He also says, praise to God, praise the Lord, the God of Shem. Uh, the, and he said, praise, uh, praise the Lord, the God of Shem. Canaan will be his slave and God would extend Jephna and he will dwell in the tents of Shem and Canaan will be his slave. Now, um, what people then say is that the, what is commonly known as the curse of Ham, the curse of Ham, 
And then they say the curse of Ham is dark skin. And they say that because it is believed that Ham fathered the Africans or blacks or black skinned people. Then they would say that uh, Shem, Shem fathered, um, I'm trying to think which one they say who fathered the Europeans. I think it's Shem. I think they would say that because it praised the, the God of Shem. And then, of course, Jephna. Okay. So right here, this is where they get in sense of that God cursed the dark skin itself is cursed. Right? Dark skin is cursed. And there have been great, there have been leaders who have used this verse of scripture to say, well, see, God doesn't want us mingling with black people because their dark skin is cursed. Now, now understand, um, in the next video, I'm going to get into that. I'm going to go on and expound on this more. But in Acts chapter uh, 17, I want to read verse number 26, because this is another verse of scripture that they use. And he says, verse 26, from one man, he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times in boundaries where they live. He did this uh, that they may seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him as though he is not far from each of us. So they use this, so the first thing is they totally dismiss the first phrase, from one man he has made every nationality to live on the whole earth. So they stop there and they go, oh, let's, let's kind of like not talk about that. But then what they kind of use is the next phrase, he said, and it's determined their appointed times and the boundaries where they live. Thus, segregation. This is why God wanted the races segregated. But they miss also and totally dismiss the verse 27. He did this so that they may see God. So if the only reason why God would then set the boundaries of different nationalities was that they may see God, not that they could be what? And here's their phrase, keep the races pure. So my point is this, if this is true, then did not the Europeans sin against God by traveling outside of their boundaries and colonizing. So if you believe that the right races should be segregated, shouldn't they stay in Europe? Why did they travel all over the world planting the seeds of Caucasian? So I'm going to stop here and pick it up in uh, part three, guys, because, uh, again, I just want to... Want to, um, um, we're going to continue on just, again, talking about the seeds of why, how we get to the point of uh, being conditioned to think that interracial marriage is wrong. Why do people have a problem with interracial marriage? And we're going to get to what God thinks about it as well. All right, guys, don't forget to like and share this video and subscribe to BP, the Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought or comment, Add it to the comment section below. All comments are welcome. And I will see you in the next, um, actually part three. All right.